Hi there, welcome to the Spirit of Wisdom and Revelation channel. We are going to, to speak about the futility of man today. Um, I had a, a lot of uh, various different uh, titles that I wanted to call this um, devotional. Um, and I just asked Father, Father, you know, out of all the information, everything that you've given me that you want me to share, um, what would you like to title it? And um, immediately he spoke to my spirit and said, the futility of man. So um, I just want to pray before we start. Father, thank you for the opportunity once again to minister to your sheep, Father, um, to bring what you have revealed, Father, in this week and a half to me and worked in my own heart, Father. And even as I come today and, and speak to your children, Father, they are so precious to you. I thank you for the opportunity and I can only ask, Father, in my utmost dependence upon you, that you will speak through me and that you will prepare their hearts to receive the word, Father, that goes deep into the marrow of our bones, um, that divides between soul and spirit and expose and discerns the true intents and motives of our heart, Lord. Let your word have its way in our hearts. Let it be your living word. Let it not be the words of a man, even though it comes through clay lips, but let, let it be your words. As Peter said, Father, or Yeshua, where can we go? Where else can we go? Only you have the words of life. And so, Father, I know that before life can come forth, there has to be a death. Even so, Lord, we pray, let your will be done in our hearts. Even in my speaking, Lord, let your will be done. I pray in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Okay, so let's start with scripture. And we're going to go to Luke 12. And this is with regards to um, the discourse where the disciples wanted to know um, what will happen during the end times. And um, as you know, this is what this channel is about. is preparing the workers and what he is working in our hearts to be able to endure. So let's read from verse 12 and um, from verse 1 in chapter 12. In the meantime, when they were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trod one upon another, he began to say unto his disciples, first of all. So now we have to read scripture in the east to come as well, not just in the history, not just in how it applies to us now, but also in the future. So reading this as if we are now standing with Yeshua and it is literally the great tribulation has started. It's just now started. Now imagine him standing right in front of you and this is what he is saying to you as his worker. Be Beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. So this is the first thing he wants us to be aware of. Out of everything he could have said, this is the first thing he says. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, that is hypocrisy. Now if you go to verse 15, um, it's interesting what he says there. And he said unto the man who made a judge he said unto the man, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? Verse 15, And he said unto them, Now to the disciples he's saying this, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Now, as you see now, the thumbnail or the title of this message is the futility of man. And so this possessing what man possesses is not just materialistic things, but even in itself, um, what man has accumulated through understanding and his own knowledge and his own research. And if we take that and bring that a bit closer to home, let's say... Um, with our own understanding, what we have researched in scripture, the depths that we understand it, the history that we've read, um, everything that we have accumulated, all that information, right, that is within our possession. That is what we've accumulated in our life, all our life's experiences, um, everything that you've gone through. 
um, that is of great value to you. All these things we possess, right? And even though Yeshua is warning them against covetousness, we need to understand within us as man, there is a desire and a lust for information, even uh, scriptural information. Um, it's very subtle because um, we crave more, we want more. And you might say to me, well, what's wrong with craving more of scripture? Aren't we not to thirst and desire to understand scripture? Absolutely, we are. But he does not want us to be dependent upon that which we possess. Not our research, not our understanding of scripture, not all the wisdom that we've accumulated. He does not want us to depend on that. He wants us to depend on him. So it's very subtle and the Holy Spirit wants to reveal that to us, how easily we depend on self. So let's go to verse 2. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Therefore, whatsoever you have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, and that which you have spoken in the ear in closets shall be proclaimed upon the housetops, so it will all be made known. And I say unto you, my friends, okay, those are the workers, my friends, right? John the Baptist is a friend of the bridegroom, and the 144,000 are known as the friends of God as well. And he says to them, be not afraid of them that kill the body. And after that, have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you whom you shall fear. Fear him, which after he hath killed, hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two farthings, and not one of them is forgotten before God? So he's talking about their value. But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, ye are more value than many sparrows. Also I say unto you, whosoever shall confess me before men, him shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. But he that denieth me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. And whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But unto him that blasphemeth against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven. And when they bring you unto the synagogues, and unto magistrates, and powers, take ye no thought how or what thing ye shall answer. Or what ye shall say. For the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour what you ought to say. So I had everything prepared um, in my uh, in this week and a half or so that I've prepared this message. I had it all typed down. Usually I type everything and um, I highlight key uh, uh, words so that I can quickly glance over them and just speak from the heart. Um, I have all the scriptures ready. I go well prepared into uh, before I go into a devotional and speak on it. And you know, the, uh, uh, <clears throat> this weekend I thought, I'm just going to read everything that I wrote again. And, and when I read it, I read it with conviction and in the spirit wanting father just to reveal if there's anything else that he wants me to take out from it again that he wants me not to mention or maybe add to it and as i read it i read it and i read it and i think i got to about nine pages or so and my spirit was just dead it the what i read was just dead and the thing is when i prepared it initially it was alive i i i, I what I, the conviction that came through the pages, the connections, everything, um, just spoke of his hand upon me. And yet when I read it, it was as dead as a doornail, as if there was nothing, no anointing upon it. 
And it's at that moment that Father spoke to me. And this is what I refer to now to what is previously mentioned here in verse 15. That to not covet or not hold on to a man is not the sum of what he possesses. Okay, so what he was saying to me is, I want you to not prepare beforehand, but let me speak through you. Yes, you know more or less what I want to talk about, but I don't want you to go prepared into it. I want you completely dependent upon me. And I must tell you, I was, uh, I was thinking of, of Moses. Moses, who, you know, officially became a murderer uh, and a fugitive, spent 40 years in the desert, and then comes upon this burning bush. And what he receives is basically a stick and a one line to say, let my people go. And here he is supposed to go to the prince or the, 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 the pharaoh of Egypt, who is seen as a god, a mighty man, um, People revered many slaves under him. And here Moses, a fugitive and a murderer, a man that stammering lips, um, has to go and he has to walk into the presence of this man and say with the authority of God, let my people go. Now, what kind of faith does that require to do that? Just because you saw a bush burning and you heard a voice? I doubt that. And this is what all the wilderness experiences in our lives are about, is to deal with the very issue of the fear of man in our lives. And when I think of the time that we are going to go in, I cannot help but think of that there will be no gray areas left. At this moment, people are still opini opinionated. You know, um, we pretty much you know, have opinion about uh, everything and also those who don't have an opinion about anything. I'm thinking of, um, <laughs> I'm thinking of what my daughter said to me the other day. She said, mom, you know, this, these people that are identifying themselves as various things, this, yeah, actually people are identifying themselves as wolves and, and some other animal as well. I said to her jokingly, maybe, we should say that we identify as unidentified. <laughs> and so at that moment, you know, when I'm thinking of that, I'm thinking of, you know, at this moment, we can still sit on the fence. We can still say, you know, I don't identify with, with any of these things, you know, or I, I don't have a, an opinion about this. But there's a time coming and it's very soon where there's no gray area. There's no fence sitting. You're either for him or you're against him. Um, Yeshua says that he was for me, um, soweth, and he that is against me scattereth ab abroad. So in this time that is coming, there's not going to be any gray areas. Um, and there will be persecution. We will be seen as the outcasts. We will be seen as the scum of the earth and to be taken out. We will be hunted down. That is what will happen. And the, in the face of that kind of fear that will be very prevalent in the time to come, we cannot sit with the issue of the fear of man still within our heart. We cannot depend on man and look to man. We will have to be wholly, utterly, total towards God. And this is the thing about the gospel. The gospel of God, the true gospel, is an offense. It is the Lord God orchestrated it in such a way that it will offend. And the offense lies in the totality that it requires. You can be those Christians that are still mediocre, lukewarm, and still just prodding along, knowing what to say, using the right lingo, but their hearts are not ablaze. They are not sold out to God. They're not given over to Him. Their focus is not where His focus is. They're just prodding along, making sure that their noses are clean. You know, that they're not exposed. 
doing, you know, going to church, praying, reading their Bible, but they are not in love with the bridegroom, not truly in love with him. They are still lukewarm and they will be found out in the time to come when the heat comes. But it is now the time to deal with the issues of the fear of man. So that when we stand before magistrates, when we stand before the authorities, when we stand before a sentence of death or a sentence of imprisonment or a sentence of slavery, whatever it may be, we will truly, truly fear no evil. Not because it's written, but because it's a reality for us. We have dealt with the fear of man. Um, I want to go to Acts 9. Let's read about Paul, or Saul, I should rather say, and his experience of what he went through. Let's read from verse, um, verse 4, no, verse 3. And as he journeyed, in Acts 9, as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. So here is Saul, he's on his journey, and he is about to crucify or to kill anybody that smells like a Christian. And you see the, the type and shadow of those Pharisees, those who are of the house of God, who will come against those who are ultimate, those who no longer sit on the fence, those who fear no man, those who do not trust in themselves. That kind of spirit that was in Saul is the same spirit, the Antichrist spirit, that will be in the children of disobedience and those who are lukewarm, those who have not turned to God in a time as we will be going in. They will either be for God, they will either sow towards the kingdom of God, or they will scatter abroad. There's no middle ground in this one. So here we have Saul, and he's on his way to persecute Christians. And a light comes from heaven. That means that in that moment of that light coming from heaven, it's and the darkness that was pursuing the Christians was, were confronted with light from heaven. And he fell to the earth, and he heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecuteth thou me? So note that he fell to the earth. And the first place of hearing is the place of humility. When we find ourselves in the dust, we find ourselves with our face down to the ground. This is the place where you can hear that voice speaking to you. And he, Yeshua asked him, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecuteth. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. So here is an important question that Saul is asking. He's asking, who are you? Who are you, Lord? And I think this is the fundamental question that needs to be asked. When we come to that place where he confronts us with the light so that we can see ourselves as we truly are, that the important question to ask is, who are you, Lord? Who are you really? What are you truly like? Not the way I've always seemed or deemed you to be, but who are you? And who am I in the light of you? Who are you? Because unless I know you, I cannot go. The same that Moses said, unless you go with me, I cannot go. Unless I know you, I cannot go into what lies ahead of me. Unless I know your love, your sovereignty, unless who you are is truly a reality to me, I cannot go. Who are you, Lord? It is time for me to seek you. Who are you? Verse 5. 
verse 5. And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecuteth. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. So here we have Yeshua telling him it's hard to kick against the pricks. Now the pricks is, um, was against the heels of the, the cattle, in, and it pricked them in order to get them to do what they needed to do. And so here is Saul, and he is, Lord God, is Yeshua is saying to him, you are resisting me. You are resisting the guidance of my voice. You are resisting the spirit. Now, it, for me, it's very interesting that his name is Saul. And we know that in scripture, there's another Saul. And in my previous, I think it's two Johns and a Jezebel, um, uh, I was talking about Saul that is a type and shadow of the Jezebel spirit that in these last days, that Antichrist spirit spirit that will persecute his children and the true prophets of God, that that spirit is also here in the type and shadow of Saul, a Pharisaic spirit, right? And so the word tells us that that even our own families and those members of the church that went total to him, those with a Pharisaic spirit, that they will think they do God a service by giving us over to the authorities. Here we have a soul in the New Testament and we have a soul in the Old Testament, both a type and shadow of that Jezebel spirit and that Antichrist spirit that will come against the Davids. The type and shadow of David being Yeshua. That is covetous over the gifts of the spirit that will be used mightily here. And so let's read further on where he says in verse 7. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And for me, this is the most important part of this whole of the scripture. Seeing no man. It says that the men there with Saul could not see the man he was speaking to. But even so, it's, it's the fact that no man was seen. There was a voice. There was a voice speaking. And this is what he wants to do in us. That we will come to the point where we see no man. All we are about is God. We see no man. We do not even see ourselves. And at the moment, we are so self-conscious, so self-aware of, of what will be, of um, how God will use us, or our call, or um, even the things that we need to deal with. That The, the self-awareness is so high. But he wants us to get to a point where we will see no man, not even ourselves. We will not look to ourselves. Verse 8, And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. So here, Saul also sees no man. And it says, his eyes were opened. Now obviously, it means he was lying on the ground with his eyes shut, closed, so scared, saying, Lord, who, who are you? But this is more than that. This is more than that, that once your eyes are opened to the reality of who God is and who you are, you will see no man. It will not be any more a question of who approves of you and who rejects you, who likes you, who subscribes to you, who comments to you, who pats you on the shoulder, who thanks you. You will see no man. You will be not indifferent to it, but these things will no longer matter to you because you seek only to please your master. You will see no man. And it says, but they led him by the hand. So now he was blind and he brought him into Damascus and he was there three days without sight and neither did 
eat nor drink, so he fasted. So here we have Saul that became Paul, and he was blind and he was guided by these men as almost like a babe, almost became so dependent upon somebody else that had to guide him. And this is what this opening of the eyes does to you when you see no man. It brings you into such utter dependence upon God. It brings you to such a place of weakness, such a place of an awareness that you have nothing to give. That your words fall to the ground, like when I read everything that I prepared. Seemingly significant and, you know, quite interesting to read and important to read. But it lacked the power. It lacked that anointing. Because my dependence was on what I, even though he showed me all these things. He wanted me not to look to man, not to look to wisdom, not to look to my own understanding, not to look to anything that I've compiled, not even to look at my past and everything that I've learned, only to look to him, to be blind to whatever I could give so that he can speak to his children, so that a word can be in season and of him because he told um, the multitude and his disciples that man shall not live from bread alone, but from every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And he told that to the enemy in his 40 day fast. That we are to live from the words that come out of his mouth. So that we are so given over to him in dependence that in the time to come, in that moment, the Spirit will remind us of the things that he said, but also give us utterance because we are so given over and we do not see any man. We look to him alone. Let's go to what Yeshua said in John, let's see, John 4. This. Verse 24 and 25, he says, But Jesus did not commit himself unto them, because he knew all men. And he needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Where it says that the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, I search the heart and reward every man according to, according to the fruit of his doings. That's in Jeremiah 17. He knew what is in the heart of man. That's why he didn't commit himself to man. Let's read John 5. This is where John the Baptist is talking about Yeshua. I know if Yeshua is speaking here, let's go to verse 23 in John 5. That all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. And shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death into life. Verse 25, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. And you remember Peter said when Yeshua asked in John 6, when he asked the disciples, you know, are you also going to leave me now? Um, Peter said to him, Lord, can we, where can we go? Only you have the, the, uh, 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 the word of life. Um, the, his, his word is life. 
that word that he wants to give and speak through us is life. And here Yeshua is saying the hour is coming when the dead, those who are dead within their spirit, not just those that are actually dead, but those that are dead in their spirit, that when they hear that word of life coming out of his vessels, that they will have received life. Because when he speaks, that word is a life in us. His word is alive. And only the word that he speaks. Not our wisdom and our understanding of it, but the actual word that comes out of our mouth, spoken by him through us, a vessel given over to him. Verse 30, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which have sent me. So he's saying here, I don't judge. I, I, can't, I cannot do anything. I can do nothing. He's a type and shadow. He's a patent son for us to emulate. And here he is saying, in my uh, 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 ability as a man, I can do nothing. Just like you can do nothing. As I hear, I judge. Not as I know, not as I have learned or studied all these years from a young child, um, came to the temple and, and learned scriptures. Not as I've accumulated all this information. No, as I hear, in that moment of hearing, I speak. And this is when I judge, because I hear my father speak. Because I seek not my own will. I seek not that which I know. I seek not my own flesh, my own understanding, my own wisdom out of scripture. However true and impressive it may be. I seek only to hear his voice in that moment and then to speak. But the will of the Father which have sent me, I do not seek my own will. I don't seek to give you my opinion. I don't seek to to give you understanding of what I have known. I seek only the will of the Father, that the Father's will may be made known in this moment as I hear it. Verse 31, if I be witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another that beareth witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. Ye sent unto John, and he be witness unto the truth. But I receive not testimony from men or man, but these things I say that you might be saved. Wow. I'm saying this so that you might be saved. He's saying, I don't receive a witness from man. I do not need you to agree with me. I don't look to man to approve of me. I don't look to man to give me a pat on my back. I don't look to man to tell me how eloquent my words were. I don't look to man to affirm me. I don't look to man to thank me. I testify of the Father. Because the words that I hear from the Father, that I speak. So when you reject me, you reject him who sent me. This is why it's important that we understand that when he said to us, do not prepare beforehand what you will speak, it had everything to do with not fearing man and be wholly and completely dependent upon the ability to hear the voice of God in that moment. And just as it was with the case of Saul, who fell down to the ground and said, who are you, Lord? And then he heard the voice. So we must understand that this is God's dealing with us. That unless you fall to the ground and say, Lord, who are you, Lord? That I may hear your voice. That I may be blind and see no man, but only hear your voice. So that I can be a vessel given over to you and speak your word that you give me in that moment. Who are you, Lord? So that when they come against me, in John 16, when they reject me, I can know that the servant is not greater than its master. 
because if they persecuted the master, they will also persecute the servants. But I can know, according to your word, Father, that you said that when they reject me, they reject him who sent me. Just as Yeshua said, when they reject me, they reject the one who sent me, my Father. But I receive not the testimony from man, but these things I say, that ye might be saved. He was a burning and a shining light, and you were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. He's a man, right? You were okay with that light. That light which he shone was good. You were willing to receive it. But I have a greater witness. The Father is speaking through me than that of John. For the works which the Father have given me to finish, the same works that I do, bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. And the Father himself which have sent me have borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice. You have not fallen to the ground. You have not asked that vital question, Who are you, Lord? Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. You have not come into his presence and asked him to reveal him to you. You have not seen yourself in the light of who he is. You do not fear God because you do not know God. And you have not his word abiding in you. For whom he have sent him you believe not. I am the light. You were willing to receive the word of a man, John the Baptist. You were willing to, to accommodate his preaching. You were willing to listen occasionally to what he has to say. But I who am the light and I who have the Father speaking through me, who is an offense to you because it shakes you in your categories and confronts you with your religiosity, with your dependence upon self, with the way you deem me to be or God to be, because you are holding on to how you see God. You have determined already in your heart who my Father is. You already uh, 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 have decided that this is how he operates and you're willing to accommodate that. But now because I speak the truth and the gospel is an offense because it requires that you will give even that up of how you see my father. Now you are offended. You are not willing to receive the light that exposes your darkness that you are walking in because you believe it is light. But it is your own fleshly understanding because you think you have searched the scriptures but the scriptures testifies of me who I am. But I am the one who want to reveal myself to you that you may know me. He says to them, search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life and they are they which testifies of me. And so we can boast ourselves in how much of scripture we can memorize, how much of scripture we can uh, understand through the Strong's Concordance, how we can put all the puzzle pieces together, we can, we can, you know, go out and even minister. We can say long sentences, quoting scripture and impress. But where the crux lie is whether we have the ear to hear and allow him to speak through us, because only those are the words of life that is as a two-edged sword that will pierce between marrow and bone that will prick the hearts of those who listen to us as those whose hearts were pricked when they listened to Peter after the outpouring of the spirit he confronted them as the spirit came over him he started testifying that it was they who crucified Christ and they when they were the word says when they were pricked that prick means they were vexed in spirit it, it means to irritate emotionally 
They cried out, what must we do to be saved? That is a word of life that comes from a mouth of somebody wholly given over to the Spirit and it pierces into the hearts of people. It doesn't stroke them. It doesn't give them the occasion to say, you know, it's a very interesting argument that you're making here. I think I'll come back to you. I'll think about it. I'll pray about it a bit. I mean, all the religious answers. No, they were pierced. They were pricked in their spirit, in their hearts. And they cried out, what must we do to be saved? This is how he wants to use us. But unless we fall to the ground and say, I bear myself before you, God, to take away every dependence of any form of flesh that I hold on to, any understanding, no matter how religious it is, no matter how beautiful, beautiful and impressive it sounds, no matter how the volumes, high the volumes are of what I've accumulated through the years, I come as nothing before you because I know nothing. I have nothing to say. Only your words of life will be able to raise the dead. Yeshua tells them in verse 40, And you will not come to me that ye may have life. And the reason why you won't come is because it costs too much. Because the gospel is an offense. The gospel is not going to accommodate where you are. It's not going to accommodate your view of how you see me because I am ultimate. Verse 41 I receive not honor of man. The same as I receive not testimony from man. He's saying, I reject. Anything nice you have to say about me. Any approval that you want to give. He said to the, the rich young man or the young rich man. He said to him, uh, when he came to him, he said, Lord, what must I be, do to be saved? And he said to him, do all the commandments. He said, already do all the commandments. Which of the commandments? And then he said to him, good master. And he said to him, Yeshua said to him, why do you call me good? There is no good in man. No good in man. This is what he has to show us. He has to show us the depths of the depravity of our heart. He really has to lift that veil. A light from heaven has to come, figuratively speaking, and lift up the veil of our understanding of the depths of the depravity of our heart, especially when it comes to our religious service. Especially when it comes to how we serve him, how we worship, how we minister, how we talk, how we study, what we know. Because ultimately, where Jezebel hides, where this antichrist spirit hides, this, this flesh that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, against who God is, that vain imaginations hides in religion hides in our walk and remember Saul a fair, he called himself the Pharisees of Pharisees he had one heck of a resume that he could boast in and he said I count all of this done for the excellency of knowing Christ it's all about knowing God but you can only know him when you fall to the ground and he shows you who you are. Nothing. Dust. Verse 42. But I know you. That you have not the love of God in you. And somehow the love of God is vitally connected To knowing him as he truly is. He basically is saying to them. Because you don't know my father. You cannot receive. That which I say. Because my father is ultimate. He asks everything. He asks everything. 
And he's asking that of those who will follow him. He says, unless you hate mother, brother, sister, friend, even your own life, unless you hate it, you cannot be my disciple. In the other Gospels, he says, unless you forsake them. But this hate, why would he say we must hate these things and hate ourselves? Very contrary to what the world is teaching, you must love yourself. Even the false lie of saying you cannot love another person unless you love yourself. That's the problem. We do not hate ourselves. We love ourselves. That's why we get depressed. That's why we get offended. That's why we can't take critique. Not because we don't love ourselves. It's because we love ourselves. That we can't handle it. But he's saying unless you hate that life in you. That self that wants to exalt itself in a religious garb. That self that wants to depend on what it knows and its own wisdom. Unless you hate that and you deny that. You cannot be my disciple because being my disciple means you have left all those things. You see no man. You see only God. That is who you see. You don't look for the approval of man and you do not fear man. You are wholly dependent upon the words of life that I give you. Verse 44, how can you believe which receive honour one of another and seek not the honour that cometh from God only? He's saying you've got a choice. You can either receive honour from God or you can receive honour from man. You can either have man applaud you and tell you all these nice things and build you up and you can say that you are doing it for me. But deeply in your heart, you know, you relish it, you enjoy it. Or you can seek the honor that comes from me, but the honor that comes from me does not come immediately. It comes right at the end where you will receive a crown. But will you be able to wait in the face of persecution for the honor that comes from me alone? Because if you're not, it shows your unbelief. This is why he says, how can you believe when you receive the honor of man? The honor of man has everything to do with unbelief. And if there's anything in you that still seek it, that still get offended when you don't get a thank you, when you don't get recognized, when you have to do something and you don't want to do it, and you mope, when... When you moan, if there's anything in you that still do something to be recognized, that you want to be seen as the prophet of the hour or the one with the greatest dreams or visions or the one with the greatest understanding of scripture, if there's anything in you that still relish that, no matter how small, remember that a little leaven leavens the whole lump. If any of that pharmaceutic leaven is still within you, covets these things of man that you possess still and hold on to if any of that is still in you you are still in unbelief and you do not know the father not as you ought to because when you do know the father you will be brought to dust you will be brought to dust and you will see no man and you will be Utterly dependent upon me, upon my spirit. And you will not dare to look to yourself. You will cling to me in utter weakness. Because this is how our spirit waxes strong. In John 1, it says that John the Baptist's spirit waxed strong in Oh, it's in Luke 1. John 1 or Luke 1. I think it's in John 1. And then in John 2, it says that Yeshua's spirit waxed strong. God's currency is your weakness for his strength. For in your weakness, I am strong. 
when you are weak, when you are suffering, when you are going through all these things. This is my currency. This is how I do business with you. Your everything for my everything. Because I alone will get the glory and the honor and the praise. Verse 19 in John 5, he says, Then answered Jesus as sent unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. Just like Saul, when he fell to the ground, the word says, When he opened his eyes, he saw no man. And so, the the word says that he that is, uh, blessed is the man that is pure in heart, for he shall see God. It's all got to do with the purity of heart, with being without guile, not cutting the corners when it comes to when we speak to people. You know, what kind of person in the time to come, where we, where I said now that there's going to be no gray area, it's put up or shut up. There's not going to be, oh, I think I'm not so sure about this. No, you're either for him or you're against him. And they will hate you because you're for him. But what kind of person does it take? What kind of work will he have to do in us to be that kind of person that will not fear death? What, what does he need to work in us so that we will not cut the corners when we need to speak the truth? You know, we will not, will not play a game. We will not placate to people's needs. That we will speak the truth in love, but that we will be willing that that truth will cut to the heart, into the bone and marrow. The only way that can be done is when we say, Lord, judge me first. Let me first fall to the ground. Judge me by your word. Expose the leaven in my heart. Expose the trust that I have in my own understanding. Everything that I've accumulated. Expose the idolatry of my heart. Expose this which is in enmity with you. Even though it's in a religious garb. Because it persecutes the truth that you want to speak through me. It silences the truth. Because I rather want to be seen. I rather want to have the pedestal, the platform. I want to glorify you, but actually, I want to be seen. Expose that in me, so that I am nothing in my own sight. I see no man, I only see you. I hear your voice and I see you, because I've allowed the two-edged sword to judge me first. Because that's the reason why the sword is, is uh, two-edged. Both sides cut. Therefore, it must first cut the speaker before he goes out and preach and speak that which God gives him to speak because he's allowed the sword of the Spirit to cut himself first before he goes out with that sword and cut into the hearts and prick the hearts of man. It's a living word then. Because it's a reality. Let's go to John 4. From verse 27. Jesus answered and said, A man can receive... Sorry, yeah, G John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. You can receive nothing unless it comes from heaven. Unless it comes from God. Whatever you have to give will fall to the ground if it comes from out of yourself, no matter how great a revelation you think it is. It has to be his words through you. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, this is John speaking, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. 
He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom which standeth and heareth him, heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy therefore is fulfilled. John is saying, I hear his voice. I'm not the light, but I hear his voice. He must increase and I must decrease. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly. In other words, carnal. A man. Dust. That is who John saying he is. And speaketh of the earth. What I have to say is human wisdom, even though it's religious. He that cometh from heaven is above all. It's words of life that causes the dead to be raised. And what he have seen and heard, that he testifieth, and no man receiveth his testimony. Once again, he's reiterating what Yeshua said. He receiveth from the Father what he sees and hears. Verse 33, he that have received his testimony have said to his seal that God is true. In other words, he receives the Father. For he whom God have sent speaketh the words of God. The apostle, apostle, apostle means a saint one, just like Moses was the first apostle that was sent to Pharaoh. He is a saint one. He goes with a saint word because he's received it from above. But in order to receive it from above, he must decrease so that God may increase. So that it's not Moses' word, it's not the apostle's word, it's not the prophet's word. It is God's literal word through their mouth. Like Isaiah said, when the train filled the temple, he said in Isaiah said, he said, um, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips. The first realization is, I am a man. I am dust. I'm nothing. I have unclean lips. I'm aware of the guile in my heart before a mighty holy God. And he said, Lord, touch my lips. And Lord, angel came and touched his lips and his tongue with a burning coal. The living word of God has to touch our mouth. And he will only do that if we realize that we are a man of unclean lips. That we are nothing. We have nothing to give unless he gives it from above. and Unless we hear his voice. Verse 35, the Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hand. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but he, the wrath of God, abideth on him. It is a mercy and a grace for God to extend this time for us to seek his face that he may reveal himself to us in earnestness. We must seek him and say, Lord, who are you? I've served you for so many years. I'm tired of this world. I'm tired of Christian cliches. I'm tired of, of hearing about dreams and visions and all these great things and I don't have the reality of who you are in my life. I want you to be so real to me that they, I see no man. I do not even see my own seeing or my own speak my own or hear my own hearing or speak my own words. What I am about is just you. As a servant or handmaiden look to the hands of her mistress or her master, so I look to your hand, Lord. I'm looking to you to move. I don't want to move. I want the reality of God, of who you are, the truth in my life. Even if it means you expose everything in me that is not real, that is religious, that's just a religious goal. I want to read a word Father gave me not so long ago. 
even before he showed me and spoke to me all these things. He's so faithful to come after he's given me a word to flesh it out and, and bring substance to it. I pray that you will hear what he has to say. He gave it to me on the 27th of February this year, and it's called From Dust to Glory. I, the Lord, dwell with the lowly, those who seek not honor nor glory, but choose the path of humility. They who seek not the applause of man, nor the praise of the crowds, those who seek me in the lowly places of their inner sanctuary, who are contrite and broken and know that they are dust. For surely when they have come to this place, they cannot raise themselves. They can only see my feet. But I will raise them in my appointed time to be kings and priests who have walked on the road I have traveled. They have followed me when I called and were willing to go into the depths of depravity and poverty of spirit. For blessed are the poor in spirit, yes, blessed indeed, as I will raise them up from dust to glory. But who can ascend into my holy hill and stand before me in my presence? Only those who have traveled to the depths of, of darkness where they have seen and know the depravity of their own heart. Those who are willing to look and see and be known as even I know them. For unto them is given to know me, to know my heart and to come into my secret counsel. They see only me and therefore they are not lured into the temptations of this world. They look neither to the left or right, but only see me. Therefore, they will not follow another, for they truly know my voice. I will teach them my ways and will guide them to walk through the valley of the shadow of death, as there is no darkness in them, a light unto many to lead to me, Many will follow them simply because they follow me, and they will guide many of my lost sheep into the shelter of my arms. It is them I anoint, and their cup will surely run over, for they were willing to drink the cup of the poverty of spirit. Therefore, I will not only restore, but give in abundance to those who walk in lowliness of mind then those who seek only me they will come up to the mountain and there be fed in my presence and my glory forevermore i think of uh psalm 24 which says um it talks about the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof and all they that dwell therein. And then later on it says that, um, you know, it says who may ascend into the hill of the Lord and who may stand in his holy presence. Um, he who has a pure heart, clean hands and a pure heart, who's not lifted up his soul unto vanity nor sworn deceitfully. And he said, these are they that seek thee, O Jacob, that seek your face, that seek you, Lord. These are they, they that are willing to have clear hearts, clean hearts uh, and hands, who have no guile within their spirit. They seek thee. And then it says, lift up your heads, your, ever, your gates and your everlasting doors, and let the King of glory come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. Now think of your mouth as a gate. Think of the Lord that comes into our heart, right? He comes into our heart and he walks through the gates of our mouth as the king of glory. And it's a word filled with the glory of God coming out of a pure vessel. It's just a vessel. And the word says that who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. 
That word that comes out of your mouth comes and brings life. This is why I say, do not think ahead before the time what you will speak, because the Spirit will give you utterance. The Spirit that you are filled with, as a vessel given over to me, will utter life-giving words out of your mouth. It will be living water, as the word says uh, in Proverbs ten eleven. it says that the, the mouth of the righteous is a well of life. Your words will be a well of life and it will give life. And people will look to us and say, where can we go? For you, you have the words of life. Just as Peter looked to Yeshua and says, where can we go? You have the words of life. I'm going to read what um, Paul said to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 1. Let's go there. Let's read from verse um, 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, that gospel of offense, not with wisdom of words, not my own understanding, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. He's saying, if I speak of everything that I know, what I've learned as a Pharisee of Pharisees, because I can open the scripture and reveal scripture with scripture and I can give great understanding, I do not come with the wisdom of, of, of my knowledge, of what I know, ever so impressive and true, lest I make the cross of Christ to none effect. In other words, I come in weakness so that I can depend on the finished work of the cross. So that this power of God can be made manifest in what I'm speaking. So verse 18, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but to unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. So when you are fully, when you are fully dependent upon God to speak through you, because you are weak, you are manifesting the power of the cross through your words, because it will be the power of God made manifest, manifest through a weak vessel. He alone gets the glory and the honor and the praise. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of of the prudent. Remember the Pharisees, those who thought they knew the scriptures and could name it and claim it and, 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 and open up the word, who the people went to for understanding, right? Even within our own circles. He is saying here, I will even make that to be foolishness. For when God speaks, when he speaks, whatever man knows, no, however impressive and true, falls to the ground as dust. Only his words have the words of life, as life. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? He who knows the word. Where is the disputer of this world? Man's wisdom in general. Have not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign because of unbelief. It's, Yeshua said it's a wicked generation that seeks signs and uh, wonders. The Jews require a sign. They are in unbelief. And the Greeks seek after wisdom. They lean upon the tree of the wisdom of the knowledge of good and evil. Even if it's in Christian things. But we preach Christ crucified. We preach totality to the cross. We preach weakness. We preach we are nothing. We preach that it is only him. We see no man. We preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. 
a housewife here in South Africa, nothing to my name, and nobody. That's God's wisdom. That's what he does. He uses his nobodies. You have to be a nobody. You really have to be a nobody. You cannot just be lip service. You have to be brought into that reality. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised. And God has chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. So that when we stand before the magistrates and the law and whoever, when he speaks through these weak vessels, these nobodies, when he speaks, it will confound them because it's his words. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom. He's our wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. He is that in us. That according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Verse 2 from chapter 2 in 1 Corinthians. For I determined not to know anything among you. I do not come with my own wisdom and understanding. Save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. He's saying, I, I didn't come with my own wisdom and things that I understood. I came in complete dependence upon God. And that left me in weakness and trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. I didn't come to impress you. But in demonstration of the spirit and of power. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men. But in the power of God. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. Yet not the wisdom of this world nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. God's wisdom is perfect. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. When God speaks, he speaks in mysteries as well. And those who are not in the spirit, those who are still carnal, those who still depend on their understanding of scripture and how they see things and everything they've accumulated, they're still carnally minded whilst they think they're spiritually minded. They cannot receive the things of the spirit. They cannot receive it because they still see man. They still see themselves. They still depend on themselves. They do not live by faith. They are still in unbelief. Verse 9, but as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. The mysteries, the things that he wants to show us when we trust him in such a way. But God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit, not by understanding wisdom uh, uh, and revelations that we've accumulated, but by his spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man. You cannot know the things of God. As a man you cannot know it. But the Spirit of God. Spirit speaks to Spirit. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man, that in you, the natural man, that understanding and wisdom, your own way of thinking about God, about life, about everything, your opinion. That part in you hates and is in enmity 
with the Spirit of God. That natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. That natural man has to be brought to naught. That natural man has to be brought to the dust, has to fall and be blinded so that you see no man, not even yourself. For they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. Why? Because the word has already judged him. For who have known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Um, the Lord has uh, led me to uh, do a voice recording of a book that I've read a while ago, and it's called The Antichrist in Man. And with the previous devotional or short teaching that I did the appointed time, I was speaking about the different uh, uh, veils of the, the worker bride during the tribulation, which is scarlet, purple, and um, white. Um, also gold. I was speaking about that and um, how we find the same example of Jezebel in Revelation 17, also dressed in scarlet and purple and gold and pearls. And you see that she represents the bride of Satan, so to speak, and how the enemy uh, duplicates, because he has no original thought, so he duplicates the same, um, the bride, what she will look like. But this book is called Antichrist in Man, and it speaks about that Jezebel. It, it talks about the flesh that is in enmity, that flesh in us, that, that dependence on our own understanding, and, and especially in the spirit, um, how it's in enmity with, with the spirit of God in us and wants to persecute it. Um, it is where we look at the book of Revelation and we see the macro view, the end time eschatological understanding. This book talks about the reality of that within us. And um, uh, it's very revealing and very, If it was written in 1647 and it exposes um, the works of the flesh within us. And I really pray, I will post it on YouTube and on my Telegram account as well. I really pray that, that you are divided into it between 10 and 15 minute videos. So it's just listening to it. And I pray that you will allow the Spirit to show you these things. Um, and, and allow Him to bring you to that nothing. I, I believe Father guided me to do it in order to serve his children, to, to that it may minister to you and allow the Lord to bring you to such a place where you say, Lord, cut deep, cut to the marrow, bring the axe to the root, that I am fully dependent upon you for the time to come. Thank you for listening to this or watching this um, devotional teaching. I pray... Um, I truly pray that you will hear what the Spirit is saying to us in these last days. That we will be so dependent upon Him even more, every day more and more, seeking His face and asking the question, Who are you, Lord? Bless you.